Well, hey there, idiots. Welcome back to Observe. In today's video, I'm going to be analyzing the nonverbal communication of Stephanie Lazarus in regards to the crime that she committed back in 1986. A little bit more on her a little bit later. For now, I wanted to let you know that this will be broken up into two separate parts, not only due to the length of the interrogation, but also due to my own time restrictions. Also, I will be following YouTube's community guidelines as closely as I can to be able to make sure that this video gets out to you. Finally, before continuing into the actual backstory and analysis, I want to be able to make something very clear to those of you who are watching, and I have done this time and time again, and I will continue to do so because it's vitally important that you know this for accuracy's sake. Nonverbal communication is at best 70 to 80% accurate with some leeway on either side. You can push that up to 90 to 100% accurate at times, but there are factors to do so. In this sort of situation with these sorts of videos that you see here online, they are meant for entertainment purposes mixed in with the ability to learn some of the techniques that go into nonverbal reading. That being said, with any video file that a nonverbal analyst is relying upon, it is extremely difficult to get a fully accurate read. There are many, many factors that come into play with this, but that being said, these are still excellent for education and entertainment, and that's all the disclaimers that I want to be able to give. Let's go ahead and roll the intro. So, as I mentioned before, I'm going to try to stick to the YouTube guidelines as best as I can, so that will prevent me from offering some of the more gruesome details of the Stephanie Lazarus crime. But, back in 1986, Stephanie Lazarus was an LAPD officer, and a crime was committed towards the significant other of somebody that she used to date. Now, the details of that crime are quite brutal but it does include physical assault, both with a firearm and the butt thereof, and also biting. What makes it interesting is that some of the wounds that are inflicted upon the victim happened after death. The investigation ensued and a tip was given to the investigators to look at Stephanie Lazarus at the time, but since she was on the force, they decided that it wasn't worth their time. So the case was then closed as a cold case for many years before it was reopened due to the need for an increase in activity in a precinct, and they started over as if from scratch. Immediately, it became evident through DNA evidence that Stephanie was at the scene of the crime itself. They brought her in for questioning and shortly thereafter found her guilty. I was very frustrated to hear the ineptitude of the initial investigators in this case refusing to look at one of their own as a possible suspect despite being tipped off and also there being physical evidence of her at the scene. Very frustrated on that front, but that's enough backstory. Let's go ahead and dive into the actual analysis itself. Do you know who she was or anything? Well, I, let me think. God, it's been a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I may have met her. Um, geez, you know. Yeah, uh, well, let me see. So I know that this starts off into the middle of the interrogation. There's some before this, there's some after the segments that I'm gonna be working on here. This is some specifically selected areas that are more interesting and engaging. But something to note on Stephanie Lazarus's nonverbal baseline is that she has very, very intense eyes. That's something that's a part of her, so it can't be used as evidence, therefore, later on, unless it's significant in that area. Along with that, she has a fairly expressive face, and this is both good and bad for her case. In some areas, the expressions are shown to be false. In other areas, the expressions are shown to be true, and it's very revealing to a nonverbal analyst to be able to assess what her face is emoting at the time. During this read, I will be paying attention to things like tonal and verbal cues, along with what her face is telling me, and from what I can see, what the rest of her body language is telling me as well. And we will build this character sketch non-verbally as to who she is, and by the end, we would be able to say whether or not we would find her as guilty. Now, in this case, obviously, we find her as guilty because she already has been found as guilty and there was physical evidence, but this is still, like I said, for the sake of entertainment and for the sake of understanding how to read nonverbal communication. Let's continue on here. Hey, let me ask you, you said you, you dated John. How long did you guys date? I mean, well, are you guys, is this something, 
I mean, you said I was going to interview. So she's having trouble verbally processing and she's acting very taken aback. And for a little side history here, they didn't tell her that she was coming in to be interrogated for this murder that happened ages ago. They told her that it was for something else so that they can get her in there and have her guard down. So she is actually quite surprised by this so that verbal stammering and stuttering is to be expected by that level of anxiety. You could also see a contempt smile on her face with one half of her face going upwards and the other half remaining steady. That is an indicator of moral or intellectual superiority as many of you already know if you've watched this channel before. Let's continue watching. Tell me about art and how well, you guys are... Here's, here's, <laughs> I mean... Stephanie, here's the situation. It's basically we you know, we knew that this, uh, when we saw this in the in, in this chrono that... So you can see that she's starting to panic a little bit as well just by the increase in her breathing. This is also common in high anxiety situations, agitation. An increase in breathing is your body's response to stress. It prepares you to be able to fight or freeze or flight. Sometimes fawn is in there. In this case, that wouldn't make so much sense, but it's part of that response mechanism that we can see coming out here as well. She's obviously catching on to what's going on and she's not happy about it. And her face is quite emotive as well, but due to the fact that it is so overtly emotive, we have to look a little bit more carefully to be able to fully analyze what expressions we can see going on. Maybe, you know, there was some relationship there. That's what the chrono seemed to indicate and we didn't want that expression of the eyebrows drawn forward and together like that, that can be considered in the anger or frustration or disgust or scorn in that grouping there. But also you can see around her mouth, she has the corners of her nose have a little bit of action and her mouth is playing into that as well, which is another indicator of disgust. So it could be a scorn expression, but in this case, it also would make sense that it's a confusion expression as well. People can be frustrated by being confused and there's many, many emotions that can play into confusion in and of itself. Regardless, she has scornful confusion right now. She's frustrated that she's been more or less duped into coming into this interrogation to come up to you at your desk and ask those kinds of questions or do anything. You know how up there people can see what's going on if you go into an interview room or people are in there getting oh, supplies. Okay. So we, we wanted to afford you some privacy, some confidentiality okay. to talk. Oh, that's fine. And you could see a little micro movement of her head. No, while saying that's fine. This would be one of those areas of nonverbal seepage that you might be able to expect when somebody doesn't feel the way that they're saying they feel. She says, oh, that's fine, but you could see the slightest movement of a no in there, which is the truthful indicator. It's indeed not fine. She's indeed not happy. And the dismissive gesture goes in line with that. She's not happy about this. Her body language is showing it, but that's pretty obvious so far. Let's continue watching about this because we thought it might be you know something you know you're married to someone else obviously and so forth and that you may not want to you know talk about these things in that setting where someone you know we don't want the rumor mill or gossip or any of that kind of stuff yeah, I mean, to start. that's fine i mean so we, we, we did this just as, as a means to try and speak to you in okay, just a confidential I mean, I just... place where you you know we're once again very many no shakes in there some shrugs in there dismissive gestures looking away she's not fine with this whatsoever but she has to be in this area now, she's realizing that she's stuck here and she has to figure out a way to maybe go along with them now. So if she can go along with them, maybe they won't suspect her as much. This is already getting to work into her psychology. That's good. That means that it's more likely that she will reveal something either non-verbally or verbally as the interrogation goes on with this being such an early indicator. Good to see for the investigator slash interrogator's part. Not so good for Stephanie where your business isn't out there for other people in, in well, you know, I mean, your division yeah, in Yeah, I mean, you know, God, that's been a million years ago. I mean, you know, um, what year is it now? 2009? I mean, I graduated in 82. 82, mm. yeah. Um, you know, we dated. Um, I dated other guys. I'm sure he dated other girls. Um, mm. Well, let me ask you, <laughs> roughly, how long would you, <clears throat> would you say you guys dated? Oh, jeez. Um, I couldn't even say. I mean... She's attempting to say that she has no idea about any of these details, which could be true. It could be true that she has no recollection of any details. And if this were a normal incident, it would be likely true that she would be 
fuzzy in areas, perhaps not knowing the exact length of the dating time, perhaps not knowing some of the exact details of the day itself, or anything around that. But this isn't true here, and we know that to be the case because we already know how this one wraps up. So she's compensating here by showing that she has no idea about any of this stuff. How would I have any idea? So this will play into later on as she's trying to say that she has no idea and no idea and no idea. Her go-to during this was to claim that she was clueless the entire time to such a degree that it comes across as obvious, even at this point where they didn't know the answer, it came across as obvious that she wasn't that clueless because she simply couldn't be. Let's continue. I started school there in 78. Mm -hmm. I started UCLA in 1978. Mm -hmm. So here the question, I don't know if you heard it, the question that they asked is how long did you date the person's name is John? How long did you date John? And her response now is to add in so much extraneous detail. And this could be an indicator of truth and it could be an indicator of deceit. But there's some nuances between those two that really come into play in this sort of situation. With indicators of deceit, they pack in extraneous detail that has nothing to do with anything of the story of anything along those lines. It's just extra detail. It's meant to go in there to convince you that they're genuinely trying to maybe recollect or trying to give you an honest answer. It's just a smokescreen. In genuine recollection, people will recall various details as they continue through their narrative because as they continue through their narrative, it can jog their own memory and they'll go back and be like, oh wait, there was this, and then they'll go forward and so on and so forth. That isn't what she's doing here. She's simply packing her narrative with needless verbiage so that she can hopefully throw up a strong enough smoke screen to get out of this. It doesn't work, obviously, but it is a tactic. So if you see this being done in your life by somebody that you are close to, be it friend, relationship, so on and so forth, if you ask them a question and they start packing it with extraneous details, don't allow that to smoke screen you from your initial question. Still try to find out the answer to that. Let's continue. I graduated in 82. Um, I don't even remember what year he graduated, if it was a year or two before me. Okay. Um, I think he was a little bit older than I was. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I can't remember if he was born, let's say I was born in 60, 1960. I don't know if he was born in 58 or 59. I mean, I, you know, um, I mean, I knew his parents, I knew his sister. So she has a continuous no shake during this time, but it's broad. You could see it. now. The no shake and the yes shake is something that has come up on the channel quite often and quite regularly because it's a very common movement of the head. Now speaking in American culture, the nod up and down like this, it means yes, and the no back and forth like this means no. That's not the case in every culture, but with her, it is because she is in the American culture and many other cultures as well. But in this sort of situation, the broader movements like this, these are commonly conscious movements that the person is doing. They can be related to negative emotions, be it wanting to ward off a negative emotion, or I can't believe it, so an unbelievable, that's the negative side of that, it's not believable. It could be something like that, but there is just as much the possibility that they're simply shaking their head no, because that's the way that their head moves. If you see that happen in a very small, minute fashion, so say they say something positive, but their head just does a very slight no. Well, that's a red flag. That would be considered a red flag and you should take note of that. During this time, though she's doing it so prevalently, it's such a broad movement. It's not a subconscious movement. Therefore, it's not necessarily nonverbal leakage. She's also having a lot of shrugging mixed in there as well. That's an indicator of insecurity and a lack of certainty in what she herself is recollecting, which goes in line with what she's saying. But still, it's irrelevant information that she's giving. They don't care. We don't care. Why is she giving it? It's a smoke screen. His brother went to Northridge. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, his sister spent the night at my house before. Obviously, I spent the night at his house before. He probably spent the night at my house before. Um, you know, I, I yeah. you know, I don't. I, well, correct me if I'm wrong, because from what you're telling me, is you, you guys dated while you were in college together, right? Yeah, and probably after college. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I can't. Geez, um, I'm trying to think when I met my husband. I met my husband in, when did I meet Scott? Um. We're still just wondering how long you dated. That's what they initially asked, and now they've realized that she's not going to answer that question. 
and she's going to throw up this large smoke screen. So they kind of tailored it around, but we're still waiting on that, and she still hasn't given that answer. She's trying to throw in so many extraneous details that they lose track of what they're doing. It kind of, from what you can hear, kind of worked in this area to where now they're asking a different question that they didn't get the answer to their first question to yet. But it is what it is. Let's continue. Let's see. I was teaching Dare because I met Scott when I was teaching Dare up in Oregon. But we had long stopped, you know, dating before that. So you um, haven't talked to him for a long time? Oh, I, I think I haven't talked to him in a long time. Um, I couldn't even tell you when the last time I talked to him. Um, Interesting verbal repetition. So you haven't talked to him in a long time. Oh, I think, and she starts to close in on herself. Her neck disappears. This is a defensive gesture. She starts shrugging with one side of her shoulder. She has that action up in her eyebrows. She's really trying to convince that she does not know. On any level, she has no idea. She's completely clueless. And then she says, I don't know if we've been dating for a long time, verbally repeating exactly what he said. This isn't an indicator that she's being authentic during this area, to me at least. What I would see this as at that moment would be a smokescreen and a persona that she's putting on to try to pull the wool over their eyes. She obviously knows something more than what she's playing because of how overtly out of it she is trying to behave. It's very strange. All of you know this. All of you know that Stephanie Lazarus is strange. All the way around, she's very strange. I met Scott, I'm thinking in 92 maybe, um, April of 92. Okay, so this is important. You can see her eyes squinting. She's looking off into the distance. Now I know for a fact, scientifically speaking, there have been no empirical evidences for directional IQs, where a person's looking is fake or true, auditory, visual, so on and so forth. It can happen from person to person, but for the universality of nonverbal communication, it does not exist. But there is evidence to show, brought up by researchers at the University of Rochester, that during genuine recollection, a person will look off to the side, be it whatever side, up, down, side, side, whatever, but they will have a slight squint as they're trying to recollect. This is due to psychological processing and running through one's own memories. This has been decently proven. It can still have some leeway for error, but it has been largely shown that that is the case. So during this segment, she's authentically recollecting. We wanna make note of this because later on, she has some points of recollection where that doesn't exist. And that gives us a red flag more or less because then it means that she's not recollecting, she's pretending to recollect. Let's continue. It was Scott being your husband. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I was teaching Dare, let's see, what year is this? this is, we'll be married. I got married in 1996. I think I met Scott in 92. Prior to that, I couldn't tell you how long I had talked, you know, talked to John prior to that. But mm -hmm. since, um, you, since you met your husband, Scott, you hadn't talked to him? I mean, he may have called me uh, once or twice uh -huh. before we got married. Right. Um, Consistently having elevated eyebrows. Now that has a various number of nonverbal possibilities. In this area, it almost makes sense that it would be in the fear, shock, or surprise area of emotion. To have that level of elevated eyebrows is definitely a noticeable tell non-verbally. And she does this consistently throughout the entirety of the interview, which plays in line with her persona that she's trying to put off as just taken aback by any single question. If you listen to what she's saying, she sounds as if she has no idea what she has done in her life. Just not the slightest clue. It's not the case, but that's what she's trying to present. And her conscious movement of her eyebrows there also makes sense with that. Let's continue. You know, geez, I, I, lived, I moved to see me in 1994 because I lost my house in the earthquake. Oh, really? um, uh, quite honestly, I probably keep in contact with a few people from the dorms. We, we, all, we all lived on the 10th floor. Um, and um, Interesting choice of words there. Quite honestly, I keep in touch with a few people, blah, blah, blah. And the question is, if she thought that she had to include the term quite honestly in there, why is that? Are there other areas where she's maybe not being quite so honest? The answer is yes, there are other areas where she's not being quite so honest. And that is a verbal slip up of her revealing in a way that she is 
honest in areas and dishonest in others. It's an interesting facet. You could also pay attention to that. People say things intentionally many times. Sometimes there's slip ups and sometimes there's telling slip ups like, well, quite honestly, I probably was in contact with somebody and quite honestly, it could be that I was in contact or at least had an emotional connection with John Still. We only know this right now for certain because of the evidence, but at the time it should have been a red flag. There's about three or four people I keep in contact with. There's probably like six or eight of us that were all really close. Mm -hmm. And who are those um, people? Oh, geez. Um, Diana Basta. Um, the people I still keep. I, I haven't been in contact with her in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, wh wh you know, what's, uh, what's, I mean, what's this all about? I mean. Well, let me ask you that. What ended the relationship between you and John? You know, I don't, it was kind of a weird relationship. I mean, we, we, we dated. Um, I can't say that he was my boyfriend. I don't know that he would consider me his girlfriend. Um, we just, we dated, we did things. I played sports in college. He played basketball. His brother played basketball. Um, it, it, we just, you know, it just didn't work out. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. It was like, I went out with other guys, um, saw other guys, I went on lots of vacations, um, you know. And, and once you guys split, were you guys still friends or kind of, uh, you know, problems? I mean, Is it yeah. friendly, not friendly? No, I don't think it was not friendly. I mean, we were friendly. Um, uh, I know that... So she's doing a self-soothing gesture slash possible contemplation gesture with the scratching of her back of her head. But also during this time, she has multiple contempt expressions slip out there. And it's always accompanied by this like, I'm so taken aback, I'm shaking my head, I'm backing up, I'm defensive, and I have this overt confused expression on my face, which continuously shows up. And that in and of itself, the continuity of this expression all the way through her timeline is strange. There doesn't seem to be a single point that it's not there on some level. And that's strange. But the times that it's not there are actually the times that she seems to be more or less telling the truth. And then once there comes to be a point where it could be incriminating or difficult, then it starts popping out again. That's where this outrageous, confused expression and body dynamic comes in. It's very interesting. And right off the bat, if I had been in that room, this would have been such an enormous red flag that there would have been no choice but to continue asking more questions, pointed questions that slowly manipulate her into either talking herself into a corner or getting her to tell the truth even inadvertently. But regardless, her nonverbal communication is showing so many red flags that it is overtly suspicious. We went to Hawaii um, at one point. Yeah, I mean, I, you know. And you were saying that- um, the, It's 2009 now. Had you ever met his wife? I may have. Do you know, do you remember her name or anything or? Um, um, or what she did. So remember what I told you about genuine recollection, the expression that comes with it, oftentimes looking off to the side with a narrowing of the eyes as your brain processes through your memories, be it visual, auditory, so on and so forth. She's not having that here. She's looking off and to the side for sure, but there's no expression of contemplation, of memory recollection on any level. She's not trying to recall her name because she doesn't want to recall her name because she knows she recalls her name because she knows that she's the murderer. So during this time, that's where earlier was important to note that she does show that genuine recollection face during times of genuine recollection so that now, now we can see that it doesn't exist here. And I don't know what these investigators know about nonverbal communication, but if they had, they would have been able to see that and use that as a hinging point or a hook point for them to be able to push harder in their interrogation. For a living or where she worked or anything um, about her? Well, I think she, I th I'm going to say that I think she was a nurse. Um, I mean, I can't even remember how he, he said he met her. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's been so long ago. Well, let me ask you, did you go to their wedding, you know? No, I didn't go to their wedding. Um, no, I don't, did not go to their wedding. 
So in that part, I actually believe that. I don't know that fact. I didn't research to see if Stephanie went to their wedding or not, but judging just off of her facial expression here as she now has also narrowed her eyes, this is an indicator of likely authentic recollection. I doubt that she went to their wedding. I would believe her here, didn't believe her earlier. Um, couldn't even tell you what year we got married. I mean, you know, it's... Big lip compression in there as well, which can be the biting back of emotion. It also is an indicator of anger oftentimes. In this sort of situation, it might not be an indicator of anger, or it could be a subconscious leakage of it. She could be angry in relation to the wedding that would make sense, especially since she went and murdered the significant other of the person that she used to date-ish, according to her words. It's been a million years ago. You know, again, I, I mean, what... You know, I don't understand why you're talking about some guy I dated a million years ago. Well, do you know what happened to his wife? Yeah, I know she got killed. What, um, did, you, what did you hear about that? I, I saw a poster at work. Um, I'm sure I spoke to him about it. Um, I think I spoke to another friend of his about it. Interesting. Once again, watching her eyes during these moments of recollection, she also has this self-soothing possible contemplation gesture. In this area, it almost seems like it would be more of a self-soothing gesture with being able to preen or stroke the back of her head to help calm down her nerves in this sort of very intense situation. But also her eyes are still quite wide open the entire time and an indicator of not authentic recollection. Keep in mind, there is the possibility that she could still recall something and her eyes be wide open. So this isn't a solid hard fast rule. It's just where the nonverbal evidence is pushing us towards. So in this case, I still don't believe that she's actually recalling. I think she knows these details and she has to act as if she's trying to recall and can't. Um, and how did, how did you first learn about that? Jeez. <laughs> Someone could have called me. I could have heard it at work. Um, I think at one point there may have been a flyer or something. I know a good friend of his... Um, Were you on the job back then when that happened? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm sure I was on the job. That's so this is interesting as well. Somebody could have called me. It could have been at work. They didn't ask what it could have been. They asked what it was, and she decided to say what it could have been. She's trying to muddy the information here. She's really trying to muddy it. And we know for certain that she does recollect these details because she in fact committed the crime. So during this area, this is just a chance for us to learn how a person can be deceitful, how they can represent and be deceitful. Now there are a lot of Stephanie specific nonverbal tells during this, but there could be some universal ones as well. So with these things like packing in extra extra details that don't have to do with the story, not actually recollecting or showing the genuine recollection face, and some of these other various insincerity and anger disgust tells that we're seeing, those can be considered more universal, where there are other areas that are more specific to Stephanie. But it is still something that's just interesting to note that she is trying so hard to make that entire area of her life seem extremely fuzzy. And like I said, it is still probably somewhat fuzzy, it was a while ago that she did this, but you would remember a lot of the details centered around a heinous, brutal murder that you did. That's just how that works. Let's continue watching. So I would have heard about it with the flyer. Um, he had a good friend, Mike. I would have heard about it with a flyer. There you see the micro no movements. That would be considered nonverbal seepage. She's obviously not hearing about it from a flyer and her body language is showing us that quite clearly now with the small micro movements of a no to contradict the affirmative action that she's saying. Mike Boldrick, Mike. Mm. Um, um, you know. But being that you're kind of used to see uh, John, you know, was it everything okay between you guys? I mean, there was never anything uncomfortable or anything between you and her? Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, God, it's been so many years. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> if I had seen her do this in person, or was there anything uncomfortable between you two? She immediately frowns, sits back, disgust slips into her face, which we've seen this continually throughout everything. Disgust slips into her face, and then she adopts this same, I'm so confused, everything's so fuzzy for me, 
I don't know sort of thing. Right off the bat for me, that more indicates that yes, in fact, things were very uncomfortable and unpleasant. That would be far more true than whatever she's trying to more or less bullshit at me at this point with her words. I wouldn't buy that. I don't think they bought that. I'm sure you don't buy that. And I don't know why somebody who was an LAPD officer and had moved up through ranks and just had decades of experience under her belt, I don't know why she thought that anybody would possibly buy that. I just don't know. I think she expected that she could get away with this and not have any repercussions and never have to address this again. I think that might be what she thought. Silly of her, but it did work for, I believe, 26 years. It did work. And the only reason that it didn't work was because they finally decided to reopen the case and do their job. Interesting. The uncomfortable, I mean, I can't even, I can't even remember if we had a conversation. I mean, we may have, I may have, I may have seen her at his apartment, you know, geez, how many years ago is that? I don't even know what year she, you know, got killed. Where was his apartment? On Roscoe. Okay. Yeah, Roscoe and, um... There it is again, the genuine recollection expression. She's looking off to the side and her eyes aren't insanely wide as they have been in the other areas where she's not genuinely recollecting. So we can still see that this is hammering home that as she recalls something genuinely, it looks like this. Not like earlier on where her eyes look like they're about to pop out of her head as she recalls details. Um, east or west of so. Uh either east or west of DeSoto. Do you know where he moved after, did, did he move after he got married, or do you know, or? Oh, I'm sure he did. Did you know um, where he was living, or? Somewhere in the valley. Did you ever visit him and his wife? No. No, never no. went out to, you know, get together, dinners, anything I know, of that nature? No, no. Like I said, his sister used to come over. His sister had, had, had come to my place. I knew his, I knew his brother because his brother played basketball at Northridge. Um, in fact, I was just coming across some pictures that I had just scanned, uh, scanned from. Um, I take a lot of photos, uh -huh. um, like ten thousand, and I just did a service where I scanned everything. So there's that little bit where she goes off on some sort of needless tangent, once again, packing in information that nobody cares about and is not applicable to the story or richening the story in any way. Still another sign of possible and likely deceit rather than somebody recollecting something that seems applicable to the story so they'll add it back as they remember it. There's still that difference. I know it can be nuanced and it is very nuanced in real time as well, but it exists and it's very prevalent here it's another indicator that Stephanie was blowing smoke at everybody during this entire interrogation. After his wife died, did, did you talk to him again or anything? Yeah, I mean, I did talk to him. Mm -hmm. I talked to him, probably his parents, um, probably some other friends. Um. So she's trying to downplay the fact that she talked to him, which is interesting, why would you want to downplay that fact? She's pulling in that she talked to the parents, other friends, so on and so forth, they don't care, they didn't ask that, they asked if they talked to him, and she did. And her body language was synchronized when she said, yeah, I talked to him. It was very affirmative all the way around. That's good to see, that means that she did in fact talk to him after his wife died, after she killed his wife. Very interesting, uh, very dark. This is a very dark story. Stephanie really bothers me a lot. You know, I said earlier that this was gonna be a two-part series. I'm afraid I am probably gonna break this up into a three-part series because of how much action we can see in Stephanie Lazarus. Also, I would like to tell you, I have been going through classes for my master's in behavior, communication, and credibility analysis, and that's, something that's taking up a lot of time in my life, so that's why you may have seen some of these videos be a little bit shorter or in different styles because I'm trying to balance out time for you. But this will be a continued series on the channel. I'm gonna continue releasing these videos as I make them here, 
and you will be able to learn a lot. I'm also pulling in information from experts around the world, some of the world's leading experts. The information that I'm giving you is stuff that I have learned from them and from my own experience with the 10 plus years of studying this across college, universities, seminars, books, so on and so forth, and then the experience in the field of actually coaching and instructing people in nonverbal communication and the reading thereof for eight plus years. So that's why you're seeing this kind of broken up this way. There is some really interesting stuff coming out in regards to that degree that I'm finalizing everything with, but I can't talk about it quite yet. That's the, my little teaser for you, and it's helpful for you. I put out a lot of work and effort to be able to get something that could be beneficial towards you, and I'll tell you how, hopefully here soon. But I'm gonna go ahead and put a pause on this interrogation because there's a lot left to go and there's still a lot to learn. So, so far we know that Stephanie has already had multiple points that are common in deceit packing with extra information that is extraneous, has nothing to do with the storyline. She has multiple times of fake recollection of various memories or details of those memories. She's faking this persona of having no clue about who she is, more or less. She has no idea what her storyline is. And then around certain areas where there should be very sharp, vivid details because of the trauma centered around it, the extreme actions that she carried out should have sharp details. She's acting like she had barely even heard of it. So far, we're seeing a very deceitful and overtly active, non-verbally, Stephanie Lazarus. It's a very interesting read. I'm happy you've suggested this to me and I'm going down this. I hope that you're learning some things as we continue on. So if you do like this video, hit the like button and share this around because that lets me know that this indeed is a series that you would like to see the finale of, the entirety of this, because there's a lot. Like I said, there's just a lot. But if you're not interested in it, then I won't put videos out for you to watch of it. So let me know if you're new here and you haven't, go ahead and consider hitting subscribe because that's how you'll see these. If you want to see them sooner, fastest, so on and so forth, hit the bell button. Also, I do regular live streams, but if you want to see those live streams, then the bell is the way to do that because they only last for maybe a week and then they go over to Patreon. So consider doing all of those things. Check out the merch in the description below. If you want to sign up for Audible, use the Audible trial link down there as well. All of those help out the channel greatly. But, but, without further ado, that's all that I've got for today. My name is Logan, and you have been oh so awesome as you always are. And I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.